Chapter 32 Conversations in the Calm Before We could form our own secret society. Well, I just barely floated off the painting of Splendid Valley back when Homage came in. Well, what? I asked, hoping I didn't sound as guilty as I felt. Did you sneak around my back and break into my safe to look at your memories? Even after both I and you told you not to? Oh, goddesses. It was bad enough that I disappointed myself. But just how deplorable was it that I broke into Homage's private safe to do so? I hated my curiosity, and I hated myself for being so weak. I looked to Homage, wondering what to say. Should I admit it? Would it hurt her? Did she already know? Little Pip, Homage said in a sad yet stern voice. I don't know what upsets me more. That you broke into my safe and tried to undo everything you'd worked so hard for, or that you'd actually consider lying to me about it. But I... my heart broke. You paused to think. Hamish frowned. It doesn't take that long to think of how to say yes. My gaze fell to the floor. I think you'd best sleep elsewhere tonight. I felt my blood freeze. I looked up to Hamish's eyes, pleading. The beautiful little gray unicorn gave me a soft, sad smile. I was there when you made your little speech to yourself. I knew you were probably going to do this, and so you did. I hoped you could be better than that. Her words hit me, like a buck in the gut. But I'm not angry at you for fouling, just disappointed. I would rather she be angry. Disappointed hurt so much more. I could handle being yelled at, but the idea that I had failed and sat in homage. Homage looked at me tenderly. Before your worries take you to dark places, I'll tell you up front. This doesn't change my feelings for you at all, and my disappointment will be short-lived. I'm not sending you away because I don't want to see you. I'm sending you away because you've been bad and I'm punishing you. She gave me a short little smile, and I think we both know you need that as much as you deserve it. The smile faded. I'll see you tomorrow, little Pip. It took me most of the ride down the elevator to figure out why I needed punishment as much as I deserved it. There was no question of the latter. The pit of my stomach and the self-loathing in my heart told me I had done wrong. I had wronged myself, and far worse, I had wronged her. My voice in the darkness. And with that, even if she forgave, I would never be able to accept forgiveness until she had pushed me for, for it. I couldn't move on while my tail was twitching. I needed something to fall on my head, or I'd always be looking for it. I wasn't entirely sure how I'd come up with that analogy. Awareness. It was under E. But I knew it was appropriate. I walked slowly down the hall, towards the door of our suite, casually unlocking it with telekinesis. What was once unimaginable had become a feat of such ease I barely focused on it. My mind was largely elsewhere. I was determined to remain at Ten Pony Tower for a little while longer. Not for myself, but for my companions. Each of them had nearly died in the last few days. The Zenith and Calamity would both have been turned to ash by the Hellhound's attacks if it had not been for Velvet Remedy's spell, learned from Life Bloom the last time we were here. Each had suffered fearsome wounds. Velvet's injuries still left her in a cast, despite the most powerful healing magic and the best care the Wasteland could provide. Nor was I untouched, but I feared for them more than myself. Deep down, I somehow knew that I was expendable, but they were not. I had a lot of repairing to do. I wondered if I should try to get them some counseling, or should we work through this alone? I wasn't sure where to begin, or even how much I may have already done. Was I doomed to spend the next days repeating discussions we'd already had, but I didn't remember? Seeing my friends look at me awkwardly as I initiated difficult conversations for a second time? Couldn't I have at least left myself some notes? Of course, as they say, hindsight is... 
Well, no. Even that does not really apply. My hindsight was perforated. Even worse, I was smart enough to realize that I shouldn't be trying to put the pieces back together. If I thought about things too much, I might be able to reconstruct lines of logic that I didn't want to have in the forefront of my brain when we next confronted the goddess. I suspected that Tracy's telepathy didn't extend much beyond reading my surface thoughts. If it had, I think things would have been gone a lot differently in Maripony. Or perhaps she could, but I just realized or required a level of focus the goddess couldn't commit while maintaining connection to all her holocorns. The fact that Calamity had been able to surprise her about something he had looked at told me she was not nearly on top of the current thoughts as she wanted us to be. Still, if I knew the plan, or even suspected what I was up to, there was no way I could avoid thinking about it while I enacted it. These thoughts so preoccupied my head that I didn't even notice the sounds as I entered the room. But the sight stopped me dead. Calamity and Velvet Remedy, together, in bed, intertwined, moving, doing, I shouldn't be here, living now by. I had become rather exponential at stealth, and I was able to slip out fast and smooth, without making the slightest peep, without being seen. The click as I closed the door behind me sounded louder than Little Macintosh. I froze. My whole body was tense, my nerves covered in ice. My mind was reeling. I couldn't begin to formulate feelings of my own about what I just... I had walked in on. I was still panicking. On the other side of the door, I heard voices. My heart was pounding. Did... some pony just open the door? She asked cautiously. I locked it, he responded. And then, in almost perfect unison, Lil Pip! Lil Pip! I ran, as fast and silently as I could. I raced down the hall, and I could swear I heard Xena's voice flat out of nowhere, proclaiming, Doomed. I clopped my hoof on the door of Twilight's Anatheum. Part of me knew I was supposed to be banished from Homage's company for the day, but I wasn't looking to get anyway, away with anything, just to get away. I needed a place to hide, and a place to stay the night. And how much came to the forefront of my thoughts? No pony answered, and the door was locked. And I was about to unlock another anything without permission. I dashed up the stairs to the balcony, and lifted my hoof towards the door of the emergency broadcast station. Was she busy? Would the beat of my hoof interrupt a recording? Did I have the right to take that risk? And what would she do... And what would she have to say to me? How could I ask her to make an exception for me just because I had managed to invade the privacy of even more of my friends? Doomed indeed, and I deserved it. I put down my hoof. I'd just spent the day wandering aimlessly around Ten Pony Tower, avoiding every pony, and waiting until the final hour of my exile was over. Not a problem. I could go half a day without getting myself in trouble. I heard a chime in the atrium below. The elevator doors slid open, and I crouched flat on the balcony as I saw Velvet Remedy and Calamity step out of the atrium. Calamity helped support Velvet Remedy with one of his wings. Oh goddesses, I couldn't face them right now. I backed up against the MAS EBS door, hiding. You think she's upset? Calamity's voice sounded low. I could hear the odd thump of Velvet's foreleg cast as she moved awkwardly into the atrium. Well, I wish she'd just see this as an opportunity to get back at me for some of my teasing. Velvet Remedy's voice floated up from, from below. Her chocolatey smooth voice had a slightly harried timber. But I doubt she will. The poor girl had a crush on me for ages. And while I've been under the impression that she's over it, I worry she might still feel hurt. Did I? I wasn't sure. I was still too wrapped up in the fear of being caught, and now I worried that I might feel like that. It would be unfair and selfish. I had a relationship with Homage that left me exhausted, to be honest. What right did I have to begrudge anyone else for having a relationship of their own, especially 
my two closest friends. I should be happier than ever for them. I don't think you give little Pip enough credit. She's got too much heart to let jealousy eat her away. Or us. I reckon I got more to worry about in that regard from your bird. It dawned on me that I wasn't feeling happy for them. I didn't think I felt jealous. I wanted to be much a much better pony than that. If I was jealous, I didn't deserve the friendship of them either. But no, I don't think it was jealousy either that I was feeling. It was concern, an achingly pessimistic worry. Calamity's voice rose up from below again. Do you think she's here? Seems awfully... Quiet? Yes, now that you mention it. If she was in Homage's company, I would expect to be able to hear her. At least, that is, what Zenith would have me believe. I buried my face in my forehooves, suddenly blushing. There was absolutely no way this could get any more awkward and humiliating. I mean, 31! Celestia's mercy! Okay, I was wrong. Now, it couldn't get any worse. That's a lot, right? The buck asked, in ignorance. Yes, that's a lot, Remedy said. I could almost hear the rolling of her eyes. Did you? Oh no. Did Calamity really ask that? I heard the soft smack of Velvet Remedy's hoof. Good for her. You do not ask a lady that, Calamity, she scolded. Then in a smaller voice, she admitted, Yes, twice. Twice? Oh, the big idiot. And we were... That she was. Then she was... I felt my ears burning as I realized my Pegasus friend was trying to do the math. How the hell does she have time to come to Splendid Valley? Indeed, Velvet said with the silent grace of bitterness. Clearly, Hound's cutie mark should be a little pip. Obviously, that's what she's best at doing. I wanted to melt into the wall and disappear into some void beyond. I wanted the moon itself to come crashing down through the ceiling and crush me. I didn't want them to find me. And they didn't want to be hearing this private conversation. And the mere thought that they might discover that I'd been unintentionally eavesdropping made me die inside. I heard a splash. One of them had stepped in the fountain's puddle. After Maripony, I fin finally understand the alicorn in this room, Velvet's voice mused, changing the subject. I had been wondering how and why Twilight Sparkle would have chosen such a de decoration. When we find her, Calamity stated slowly, you think you oughta do the talking. Oh? And why's that? Well, y'all are just better at it than me. Little Pipple wants to know about what we are now, and all. I just mess it up. And just what are we now? Velvet said silkily. Damn it. Calamity sighed in frustration and confusion. That's just the question I was trying to avoid. Slowly, he admitted. I don't know. Velvet's voice was gentle and kind. You're Calamity, and I'm Velvet Remedy. Just like before, only more intimate. I heard another splash. I'm not going to push for us to be anything more than you want us to be. I'm never going to tie you down, or demand a commitment if you aren't looking for I couldn't help but feel this conversation was built upon a great many that I hadn't had privy to before, and that I had no excuse to listen to this one. My mind began to scramble for a way to escape. You don't even need to ask, girl. I know, Velvet purred, but I need you to know that I'm look not looking to change anything about you. Well, except maybe for your grammar. I just want to be with you. If I opened the door behind me, closed it, and stood up quickly. Surely they would think I had just stepped out of the station behind me. It seemed like a good plan. The door was locked. Of course it was. Well, surely I couldn't get myself into any more trouble. 
Oh, dang it. I don't know nothing what to say. I ain't good at that sort of thing. You don't know anything to say. Velvet tried pointlessly. But yep. Wish I did. Maybe I should just hold you. The lock clicked. I slid the door open, then stood as I closed it again. Little Pip, Little Pip. I raced down at them, both standing at the fountain's pool. Calamity's foreleg sliding away from the interrupted embrace. My heart raced, and I blurted out the first thing that I thought of. Oh, hello. I was just in there with homage, in the place, doing the thing. They gave me odd looks. I wanted to face with myself into unconsciousness. Instead, I gave them a forced and probably awkward smile. They looked at each other, then back to me. Their expressions melted into ones of compassion and concern. I realized that my awkwardness would have taken would be taken as discomfort over what they knew I had seen, and not what they didn't know I had heard. Velvet Remedy started to call up to me. The door behind me opened, and Homage peeked out. Little Pip, did you just try to come in? Her eyes narrowed at me. That's not how punishment works. Calamity and Velvet Remedy exchanged looks of quick realization. Doomed. I am not a clever pony. After 20 minutes of explaining and confessing and apologizing, went with a hint of blubbering, I found myself sitting across from Velvet and Calamity at Homage's table, feeling small and guilty as Homage made everyone tea. At last, however, I had been able to put solid thoughts into my feelings. The problem was how, or even if, I should voice them. What if my worries were correct? What damage would I do by shining a light on them? Or worse, what if I was wrong, but my questions led to doubts in their own minds? The silence stretched awkwardly between the three of us. Velva looked patient, but strained. Calamity fidgeted. If I said anything, it would have to be now, while we were together, and could draw support from each other as they answered. But what if... Calamity rubbed a hoof on the table, abstinently asking Velvet, Hey, you figure they did it on here? I changed the subject quickly, not just because the answer was yes, and I didn't want them to think about that when Homage put tea and a plate of cake on the table. I guess I'm just concerned. I mean, you two are my closest friends. We travel everywhere together, and with hardly any pony else. And you're worried that we've grown intimate out of our convenience? Velvet already finished for me tactfully. Uh, pretty much. Yeah. Calamity snorted. Now I know how y'all might think that way, coming from a stable. But I've been down here for a while now. I've had plenty of other options. Just never cared for them. He nodded upwards. Had options up there, too. None of the mares in the service shared my feelings about helping the pony folk down here. A right turn off, if you ask me. I had to admit, I'd never even considered the idea of Calamity having relationships available to him with any pony other than us. He just seemed like such a lone defender that I thought of him as being just as much a stranger to the rest of the world as we were. But hadn't Railwright claimed that Calamity had been offered a home and a place in New Appaloosa? How much came in with tea and cakes. She smiled and gave me a little kiss on my horn, which suddenly felt pleasantly warm as she floated a cup of tea to the table in front of me. I'll admit, Velvet Remedy began, that I was worried about the same thing at first. The first thing that attracted me to Calamity was his wings. I swear, y'all got a feather fetish, Calamity nipped painfully. Velvet giggled primly. No, I just abandoned my home and risked whatever I could to find out here for freedom. And there you were, more free than I'd ever imagined any pony could be. Not even the ground could hold you. Ah, shucks. I ain't no different than any other pegasi. Oh, but you are, Velvet cooed maturely. I didn't know at the time, but you were so much more. 
I always wanted to be a medical pony, and I embraced the first chance I got to. But I left my home behind for selfish reasons. You cut your shackles because they were preventing you from helping others. You freed yourself out of compassion and kinship. Calamity was blushing now. I realized I liked seeing him like that. It brought out a beauty in him. You truly care about ponies, she continued, her eyes roaming over Calamity. And I've seen how you are with us, especially with little Pip, she said, turning back to me. He'll stand by you, never leave you, protect you, even from yourself. Always there to catch me, I found myself saying softly. Velvet smiled and nodded. I feel safe with him, around, because I know that he'll protect us, especially you, since you seem to need it the most. But he has always been right there for me, when I needed him too. I was suddenly feeling guilty again, this time for monopolizing Calamity's time. I lowered my head, breathing in the calming scent of the zebra chai tea wafting up from my cup. Scowling a little, Velvet Remedy couldn't help but add. I'm not saying we're a match made in the clouds. He does tend to jump to violence as a solution far too readily for my tastes. And he's not the only one. She fixed me with a look. For a few moments, her gaze held me like steel making me squirm. Then, her expression relaxed. But I realized that, in the equestrian wasteland, violence is often the most appropriate response, although not as often as you two take it to be. And at least both of you are motivated to shed the blood you do out of justice, compassion, and a sense of responsibility to your fellow pony, all of which seems sorely lacking in far too many ponies out here. She turned to Calamity with a look that clearly said, Your turn. Homage trotted around and sat behind me, watching, unobstructively. I felt a gentle support rating off of her, despite her recent disappointment. I was supposed to be being punished, but there was no hint of that. I found myself feverishly wishing that Calamity to not blow it. I wasn't happy for them because I was worried they were going to get hurt. But I wanted them to be together, I realized. I hoped for them. And all of its words were like a ray of real, untainted sunshine. For the first time, I really thought maybe they could last together. So long as Calamity didn't say anything stupid in the next few minutes, that was. Calamity shuffled, looking uncomfortable. I take it I can't just say, ditto. I took a long sip from my cup, the slightly bitter liquid rushing over my tongue. I felt the warmth of the tea spread smoothly through me. Velvet Remedy gave Calamity a shake of her head. The Pegasus reached back to brush at his mane, accidentally tipping his desperado hout into his eyes. Well, she's beautiful, he stated. Not just outside, beyond her outer beauty and occasionally abrasive personality, she's really beautiful inside. I winced. He was going to be paying for that a bit later. I mean, from Calamity's shuffle, I guessed he knew it too, but he was being honest. I hope Velvet took that into account. Look, when we first rescued her, I didn't know what to think. She was helping slavers, and she was, well, I was expecting her to be a fancy and prissy and highfalutin like the folks in this here tower. But she weren't like that at all. She's beautiful, but she's... I don't know, down to earth? He paused, looking for a word, then smiled as he settled on practical. She's practical. And more importantly, she's devoted. She weren't helping slavers because she sympathizes with any of what they're doing, but because she's dedicated to helping folk. And she don't let on pleasantries or discomfort get in the way. Clemens wrapped his tail around Velvet Remedy, who was holding him with rapt attention. She's faithful. She stuck by our side even as we walked into hell. Her wanting to play diplomatic like with aggressive or even evil types doesn't wear thin. But I reckon maybe there's something to it sometimes. And she does that because she really likes to care about folks and is committed to helping them. Even if a mess of them don't deserve it. 
Ain't like her to ask if they do. He shrugged. How could I not absolutely love her for that? He looked into Velvet's eyes. Clemity finished by saying, It's like, you're just the doctor, what the doctor ordered, you know? Velvet rolled her eyes at the corniness, but smiled. The equestrian wasteland ain't a pretty place. It's rough, and it's grim, and it's bloody. And some days, it can be hard to remember what's worth fighting for out here. But I don't have to look any further than at this here charcoal unicorn mare next to me to be reminded just how good ponies can be, and just how worth it the struggle is. Part of me wanted to jump up and hug him. Part of me wanted to tell them to get a room. But then, I was kinda to blame for them not being there. Okay, I'm convinced, I said with a smile. How much wrapped your forelegs around me from behind? Our coupleness made me feel less awkward in front of the others. Yes, Velvet Remedy said suddenly to Calamity, while giving the cakes a declining look. I think they did things on this table. How much bit one of my suddenly burning ears playfully? Far too late, I changed the subject. So, how long have you two been together? Calamity laughed. You mean physically? Since what? He looked at Velvet, who was trying to keep a ladylike distance from the question. Yesterday? I blinked. Ah, come on, little Pip. We didn't even kiss before last week. Velvet Remedy sighed, then said smoothly, Really, little Pip, we have you to thank for the relationship at all. Wait, what? But yep, if it weren't for your acting like we was already a couple back in the stable, I don't think we would have started looking at each other that way. I blushed so hard, I could have caught fire. Calamity rolled two memory orbs across the table to me. You said it was okay to see these again. I caught them in a telekinetic blanket, careful not to focus directly on the, either of them. Are they... mine? Nah, traded for him. The caravan pony claimed they were genuine memories of Rainbow Dash. He gave me a weary smirk, as my heart gave a leap. I was actually thrilled to learn anything more I could about these ponies. When had it become such a passion? Are they? I asked hopefully. From what you said last time, Clemity responded, with a voice suggesting he felt snookered. Not exactly. I floated them into my saddlebags for safekeeping, and finished my tea. It was now barely lukewarm. The conversation had lasted a while. After Velvet and Calamity had taken their leave, I felt Homage's forelegs slip away from me. The cups and saucers and plates of cake lit up with the glow of Homage's horn, and began to float themselves back to the kitchen sink. I felt like a warm blanket had been pulled from me on a chilly winter night. I guess I should go now. I'm still being punished, right? I got up and began to move. Not in any particular direction. Yes, Homage said, a touch reluctantly. I wish punishment meant I didn't mean having to be apart from her. The thought of being alone tonight hurt more now than it did before. I stopped next to a desk littered with Homage's personal things. She had a trip check of pictures framed on the desk. Pictures of me in the wasteland, my friends nearby. The pictures were taken from someplace high above and far away. I zoomed in until I nearly filled the frame, but washed out with the odd tint of the air between the camera and its subject. I suspected these pictures were taken by the cameras on those spires, and I suspected the willing separation tonight hurt homage as much as me. Couldn't you just bank me or something instead? I asked, hoping for a faster punishment. Homage laughed. No, but tomorrow night, I might, as a reward. I looked at her in confusion. 
when you're dropping. How would a spanking be a reward? Oh. Oh. Oh my gosh. I lost balance. My head crashing to the desk. I backed up, stumbling, seeing stars. How much was chuckling even as she trotted up to make sure I was okay? I think I better go now, I told her, before I hurt myself again. I ambled through the market sector of the Ten Pony Tower, paying little attention to the ponies around me. The smells from the restaurants and snack shops teased my nostrils with promises that they were probably too wonderful for the centuries-old packaging food to deliver. But I let my nose drag me towards one of them anyway. Looking at the wall-mounted menu, my eyes widened at the prices, each of which was now written in pencil with the telltale signs of several previous erasings. I lifted my pit buck to check how many caps I had on hoof. Velvet Remedy was the queen of barter, and so we'd been letting her keep most of our caps. I barely had enough for a spark of cola or a box of stuffed apple, stuffed apple cakes filled with a sweet apple filling and 5,000 times the daily recommended amount of preservatives. Yay. I plopped down my bottle caps and ordered the cola. I watched as the pony slid the caps off the counter with a hoof, then picked up a crowbar in his mouth and trotted over to the still-functioning Sparkle Cola machine, prying it open and fetching my drink. A chain and a padlock fell to the ground, telling me, which told me how they kept their supplies secure at night. I took my cola, floating to my muzzle and tasting the lukewarm, delicious, carry freshness. I was an hour into my exile and already hating it. I spotted Calamity leaving the constabulary, looking disgruntled. Highway robbery, he grosed. Anywhere else, I could buy an armor-piercing round for what they're asking. For a rubber one, he added. Well, if anywhere else sold them. I scampered over to trot by his side. How's your wing? Calamity smiled, judging my intentions. Velvet and I are doing both fine. Well, not fine. She's hurting inside. What happened to both of us at Old Olne scares her badly. We're working through it together, so don't try to set us up with, with a shrink again. I blinked. I did that? I considered it earlier. Oh, uh, yep. Not one of your better plans, Comedy noted, but well-intentioned. I wasn't sure I wanted to see that memory. Ever. We walked in silence for a while. I drank my cola, then offered some to my friend. Calamity accepted, biting down on the bottle's rim and tilting it back for a swig. Then he passed it back. We walked in silence some more. I'm worried, little Pip. I nodded. There were about a hundred things for us to be worried about, plus several extra ones for Calamity as he plunged into a new deeper relationship with Velvet Remedy. The Enclave. The experiment in Old Olne. That's new. Post-Calamity new. And... I don't know... What they would be doing there. Why they would be doing that. Or what they are up to. He looked at me. And I'm worried. Of all the possible worries he might have, this one was the one I expected the least. But I knew what I shouldn't have. These were his pony folk, his old home. They had to be weighing on him as much as concerns from Stable 2 weighed on me. The Pegasi are good pony folk, Calamity said. Whatever happens, remember that. Because the Enclave, they ain't. Not so much. I was in a large gray foyer, marbled in gray. Large vertical windows let in the gray light on a rainy day. Outside, a dozen ponies were protesting, chanting, and waving signs in the rain. Inside, ponies trotted on personal business, or stood conversing in clumps. Many wore long raincoats, still slick with wet sheen. A few were hauling small wagons filled with boxes. 
My host was an earth pony mare, sitting behind a long counter, gazing languidly at the text on the terminal. From the stirring warmth in certain parts of her body, the story she was fixated on was of a cloppy nature and probably not safe for work. A familiar voice echoed from somewhere above, and a safely distance enough that my host was able to change the screen to a memo on wartime stress disorder, without rushing suspiciously. She looked up, her eyes moving to a spiraling set of wrought iron stairs that ascended into the areas above. The whole lobby gave me the impression of the Ministry's architecture. A flash of light erupted from four yards from my host's counter, wrenching her attention away from the stairwell before she could spot who she was looking for. Rarity stood in the lobby, wobbling slightly, her dress, mane, and the large satchel on her side all hissing of whips of smoke. She blinked, wide-eyed, seeming disoriented. But in the blink of an eye, she had gathered herself together, and was trotting to my host with an urgent expression. Hello, welcome to... My host began politely, but Rarity was in too much of a hurry for niceties. Yes, yes, I know where I am, am, and I know who you are, she said, waving a hoof. I need to know if Rainbow Dash is here. Please tell me I haven't missed her. Before my host could answer, the familiar voice answered for her. Hovering about halfway down the spiral staircase, Rainbow Dash exclaimed loudly, Whoa! Rarity! Did you just teleport here? Standing on the steps behind Rainbow Dash, Applejack was looking equally impressed. Her orange coat and blonde mane made for a welcome splash of warm colors in the stark, cold room. Rarity paused, seeing the two of them, then smiled with a soft, whiny, Yes, well, I have been trading spells with Twilight for years now. And let me tell you, it's not as easy as she makes it look. With a wince, she added, How's my mane? Rainbow Dash swooped down to greet her. It's fine. Descending the stairs, Applejack added, It's gorgeous. It looked like she'd run a few laps around a burning house. So, what's up? Rainbow Dash asked cheerfully. Rarity glanced behind her and up towards Applejack a brief look of unease passing over her face, and then turned to Rainbow Dash. I had some things to talk to you about, but it can wait until you're alone. Rainbow Dash blinked, then her eyes opened wide. She whispered, Oh, about the new... Then glancing back towards Applejack, too. Armor? Rarity nodded. That, and the other thing. I've been having a lot of trouble trying to perfect the spell, and I wanted to see the device you wanted it embedded into. Oh! Rainbow Dash reached back and scratched at a rainbow mane with a forehoof. Well, Apple Bloom is all set to procure a life support capsule from the Ministry of Peace. We should have it by next week, but, well, she's going to be modifying it a lot. Do you need to wait until it's finished? Rarity raised an eyebrow. Apple Bloom's part of this too? Yeah, why? Is that a problem? Well, Rarity said, brushing a left forehoof in circles against the marble floor. I don't really want my little sister anywhere near this research of mine, and she and Apple Bloom are best friends. Did I hear my little sister's name? Applejack said, treading up from behind them from the stairs. Rainbow Dash turned and smiled. Yeah, she's helping me on a project. I thought the Ministry of Awesome didn't actually do anything. Dash snorted and puffed herself up. They just don't do anything that isn't awesome, you mean. Rarity and Applejack exchanged looks of doubt. Anyway, I really should be going. Wait, Applejack said. You mean you teleported all the way over here just to go? She frowned. How come I get the feeling I'm undesired company? Unwanted? Rarity gasped. Oh, heavens no. If anything, I want more Applejack. She sniggered inwardly, and was glad my eavesdropping host didn't do the same. We don't nearly see enough of each other anymore, 
It feels like it's been ages since... She paused, then chimed up. Idea! We're together right now. Let's do lunch. Rainbow Dash shrugged. Sure. Why not? Applejack chimed in. Well, I've got about an hour before I gotta go to a meeting for all the governors of the Ministry of Technology. And there's a new apple fritter place that Caramel Apple's kids have just opened, which I've been meaning to try. Sounds perfect. Ready clapped her four hooves with a demure squee. Wait, aren't those the same brutes who try to kill you with an elevator? Applejack's eyes narrowed. They ain't never been proven. But still, the idea of you spending time in a room with a lot... Yeah, Rainbow Dash jumped in. Want me to come with you? If you're planning anything funny, I'll make them think twice. I can handle myself just fine, Dash. But I do thank you kindly for the offer. Seeing her two friends still frowning, unconvinced, she sighed and added, Besides, Sergeant Steelhooves has already offered to be my personal escort. Have I met this guy? Rainbow Dash asked suspiciously. Are you sure you can trust him? Applejack sighed. I don't think you have, but he served with my brother. He trusted him, and so do I. A small smirk scrolled across her muzzle. Besides, I don't plan on being there too long. Just enough to give a speech. I've been practicing it all day. Want to hear it? Rary's eyes widened as the thought of listening to another entire speech of Applejack, or perhaps just alarmed at having to do so in the public lobby where her mane was frizzled. Maybe. Over lunch? She suggested. Sure, Rainbow Dash encouraged Applejack, with considerably more volume. Let's hear it. Okay. Applejack paused, stood straight and tall, clearing her throat. Y'all are fired. Rare and Applejack stared, or Rainbow Dash stared. Applejack opened one eye and blushed. Well, how was it? That's it? Uh, yep. She blushed some more, looking a bit proud of herself, and yet a touched worried. Awesome. You tell him, AJ. Rainbow Dash grinned widely as Rarity stomped on the floor with applause. Dang, now I want to go see their faces. Hey, Rainbow Dash. A voice called out from the doorway, causing her head to whip around. Three elderly pegasi trotted to the lobby. One of them, a light gray buck, with a short, cropped, age-grade mane, fell over his eyes. Hadn't been wearing a rain slicker, and shook himself, spraying water everywhere to the shouts and grumbles of other ponies in the lobby around him. Hey, welcome, my host began to say, but her words trailed off as the three pegasi pushed their way through up to Rainbow Dash, ignoring every pony else, including her friends. Hey, Rainbow, remember me? A mustard-colored buck asked, stepping toward in front of the others. He was an unusually large buck, his rain slicker covering over half of his flank, revealing most of a large orange basketball for a cutie mark. I wondered idly if he had a ball, or one ball, or two. Then immediately wanted to jab my hoof in my eye to kill the mental image that followed. Rainbow looked them over, then narrowed her eyes, and shook her head. Sorry, no. I'm rather busy, and I only have time to remember important ponies. The three of them scowled. The mushroom one growled, shoving a hoof into Rainbow's breast. Well then, maybe you remember my little brother. He's one of the Pegasi you got killed fighting that dragon over Hoofington. Rainbow Dash's eyes went wide. Her demeanor changed immediately. Oh, I'm so sorry. Several big ponies died valiantly that day. Yeah, said the third. The Pegasus, the color of dark dust, with piercing blue eyes and the few r remaining strands of sandy mane on his head, Seems like an awful lot of Pegasi die valiantly these days. In fact, seems like we do the bulk of the dying. I don't know any pony in Cloudsdale who ain't lost family. Rainbow Dash nodded silently and sadly. The war... The war, the dark 
Dust Pony scoffed. The war is on the ground. Against zebras. And dragons, Rainbow Dash reminded him. They're using dragons now, in case you somehow forgot. Not to mention Griven, Griffin Mercs. And some of them have magical fetishes that allow them to fly, Rarity chimed in. If you think it's impossible for an earthbound mare to fly her way into Cloudsdale with the right magic, you have tragically short memories. The mustard colored one spat. Well, they wouldn't be bringing the dragons if the Pegasi had just stayed off the war. Now, I hear you're pushing Luna's new initiative to put even more Pegasi on the front lines. You won't be satisfied till every one of us is facing down zebra guns. If the uh, had just. Rainbow Dash sputtered. What? And we ain't the only ones who think that neither, the balding one informed Rainbow Dash, coldly. And while we might not be important, my sister's the mayor of Cloudsdale, and she. Not just one apple bucking minute, Applejack interrupted loudly. Now I know y'all have lost kin, and I know how much that hurts. She strode up to the mustard colored buck. I lost my own brother in this war. His name was Big Macintosh. Y'all may have heard of him. The mustard colored pony had the dignity to look abashed. I heard a click and a whirl from above. My host turned away from the argument as the text on her screen disappeared, replaced by a flashing warning. Live grenade detected. At seemingly the same instant, Rarity gar gasped. Grenade! Ponies began to scatter, running into each other, not knowing where to go. Rarity's magic flared around her satchel, opening it. Beams of light, of colored light shot out from the twin magical energy turrets, which had descended from the ceiling. They struck a pony in the crowd, turning her into a pa burning pink silhouette of whomever she had been. My host looked down, scanning the floor, her actions seeming unbearably slow. I mentally shouted for her to duck and cover, but she seemed transfixed. Her eyes fell on the metal apple, not two yards from her desk. The dark bulk of a large, open book fell down over it, and four white hooves jumped on top. The book! In an instant, a flash of fire and swirling magical energy underneath the book. A crackling sound that left a buzzing silence in its wake and a rippling explosion that threw Rarity back. My host stumbled, disoriented, a ringing in her ears. Every pony was shouting, but their voices seemed muffled and far away. I spotted the black book. It led us to Rarity, smoking but undamaged. I felt conflicting waves of war, of horror and relief. How could any book survive smothering a magical energy grenade? Just what kind of book was this? And yet, thank the stars that it wasn't hurt. That book was dangerous, but it was valuable. Just looking at it, I knew how useful it must be. Rainbow Dash was fast. She flew up to my host, breaking her out of her fear-induced paralysis with a clop of her forehooves. Lock this place down, she shouted over the ringing in my ears. Gather the witnesses and call the Ministry of Morale. Some pony saw something even if they don't know it. Applejack was trotting around, calling out. Is every pony okay? Any pony hurt? She turned to my host and lifted a hoof, and she shouted, her voice sounding like it was coming to me through yards of thick cotton. But at least the buzzing was quickly fading. Call up the Ministry of Peace. Have them send counselors. My host nodded. Rarity groaned, getting shakily to her hooves and rubbing her eyes. Quick thinking, Rarity, Applejack said, dashing over to help her up. I reckon you saved a mess of lives with that. Applejack froze, staring at the black book. Is that what I think that is? Turning to Rarity, a dark scowl crossing her face, Applejack said, You said you were going to get rid of that accursed thing. Dutting herself off, Rarity stared back. I said I would burn it. Rarity said calmly, and I tried, but as you can see, it doesn't burn. Lowering her voice, she whispered something to Applejack, then made the earth pony, pony's ears shoot up in alarm. Then raising her voice again, she added, I even had Spike try to burn it, 
and all that did was stand up to Princess Celestia. I winced. Even my host winced, realizing that couldn't have led to pleasant conversations. Applejack frowned, clearly wanting to believe her friend, but having doubts at the same time. Rarity's guilt, guilty look wasn't helping. Well, you still should have gotten rid of it. How? Rarity retorted stubbornly. I doubt anything short of a mega spell could destroy it, and I certainly don't want to dispose of this book anywhere it could be found by the wrong hooves. Damn it! Rainbow Dash piped up, unknowingly interrupting her friends before the fierce discussion could grow into an argument. Dash had flown over the pile of ash, which had once been a pony. Whose idea was it to use magical energy for defenses in here? A pile of ash isn't going to conveniently tell you who it was, or offer up its former possessions for an investigation. Zebra sympathizers, I would suspect, intoned Rarity dourly, turning towards the very upset blue coat, coated Pegasus. Shouldn't jump to that conclusion, Rarity, Applejack warned. I don't like this blaming zebras for everything that goes wrong. It certainly wouldn't be the first time they've taken a shot at me, Rarity bristled. She looked at Applejack with surprise. After Zakora's betrayal, I'm surprised you still defend them. Just because Zakora turned out to be a bad apple, don't mean all of them are, Applejack insisted. Even though my host is paying more attention to the Earth Pony than the Unicorn, I was able to catch a brief glimpse across Rainbow Dash's face. I realized suddenly that Rarity and Applejack didn't know the truth about their zebra friend. The reality behind Zakora's defection was a carefully guarded secret, held by only two mares, and probably only the tiniest fraction of ponies within their respective ministries. Ain't like there ain't other pony folk who might want to take a shot at one of us. Rarity met Applejack's statement with wide eyes. Oh dear, you're right. Well, if it was them who was behind it, they sure as sugar ain't stopping me from getting to that meeting. Hell, Rainbow Dash blurted out, flying up. For all we know, the target may have been that lot. She pointed a hind hoof towards the three pegasi, cowering in a corner. Well, they were speaking amounts of pretty much to sedation. Her expression was cross and grim. I'm beginning to think Cloudsdale needs a ministry morale hub. Rarity looked around desperately. Oh dear, oh dear. Lunch is off, I'm afraid. I need to go back to my image. We don't have much time to figure out what to tell the news ponies about this. Three ministry mayors. Oh, this is bad. We have to move on this now. As Rarity magically scooped up the black book and vanished in another flash, my host finally began to actually do her job. <laughs>